Good morning, everyone. Very glad you could join us today for our Cable Labs Informed webinar. My name is Rob Aldifer. I'm Vice President of Technology Policy here at Cable Labs, and I'm delighted to be your host and moderator for today's program, Enabling Cable Networks for Mobile Backhaul. 5G networks will require the deployment of small cells much closer to the end user than traditional macro cell networks. Because of their extensive reach, cables, hybrid, fiber, hybrid fiber coax networks are well positioned to provide connectivity to mobile small cells for LTE and 5G networks. A collaborative development effort between Cisco and Cable Labs has resulted in a simple innovative solution that will enable this convergence between fixed and mobile networks. Today, we will describe how mobile and DOCSIS networks can communicate with one another to pipeline operations and reduce network delay or latency. We'll share details on the proof of concept development that enables real-time scheduling alignment of the access network and the small cell network. We have about 30 minutes of formal presentation content, including Q&A. After the presentations, we'll finish up with a brief recap of upcoming events on the Cable Labs calendar. Note that the presentation slides for today's webinar are available to you now. A PDF file can be found in the handout section of your GoToWebinar software. I think you'll be pleased with our panel of experts today. We have Craig Cowden, Senior Vice President of Wireless Technology at Charter Communications. Craig will start us off and provide his perspective on wireless technologies and the growing importance of backhaul networks as the deployment of 5G networks approaches. We also have Jennifer Andrioli Fang, Distinguished Technologist at Cable Labs, and John Chapman, Cisco Fellow and CTO for Cable, who will follow Craig. They will describe the current state of mobile backhaul technology and review some promising innovations that they've developed that create some exciting new opportunities in this area. Just a reminder to all participants that if you'd like to ask a question of our speakers, please use your GoToWebinar software toolbar. toolbar. We really value the interaction, so please take us up on this. So let's get started. We'll turn the floor over to our first speaker, Craig Cowden. Craig? Thanks, Rob, and good morning to everyone on the call. Uh, so I just have a single slide, and what I'm gonna do today is set up the overall context uh, for why enabling uh, mobile backhaul on cable networks is so important to, to our architecture future. Uh, so what I'm going to describe is a general view of, of Charter's wireless strategy. We really don't apply uh, specific timelines to this yet. Uh, part of it depends on technology development. But what I will say is on a single slide, if we had to describe our wireless strategy, it would be something along these lines. And so the first thing I'll say is we already are a wireless company, as most cable companies already are. Uh, it's just that most of us yet uh, are not mobility providers. So we don't necessarily monetize the wireless traffic we do handle, but we handle as much as 80% of wireless traffic in the home and in the office through our Wi-Fi infrastructure. And so we endeavor to become a true mobility provider and to monetize that asset. And so later this year, we will launch a mobility service. It will be based on First, a transition to a wi what's called a Wi-Fi first MBNO. Uh, MBNO stands for Mobile Virtual Network Operator. So essentially, we're wholesaling network capacity from a wireless carrier uh, for the broad umbrella coverage of mobility service, but we want to put as much of our traffic uh, onto our own infrastructure as possible. So when we say Wi-Fi first MBNO, we want to put as much traffic onto our Wi-Fi infrastructure as we can. And that eventually we'll transition from a Wi-Fi first MBNO to a small cell first MBNO. And so to be a little bit more precise, Wi-Fi is an unlicensed small cell. So eventually we'll transition from Wi-Fi or unlicensed small cells to a combination of both Wi-Fi and small cell, licensed small cell first MBNO. And so when we talk about that, we'll look at both 4G and 5G access technologies for license access. Uh, we will uh, first start with, with 4G small cells, and then as 5G technology develops, uh, we'll look at that as well. But it's really for the same reason. We want to ensure a superior connectivity experience with the combination of our Wi-Fi assets, with the combination of our future small licensed small cell assets. Uh, we believe we can offer a su uh, superior connectivity experience. And why do we think that? Well, we think we have an inside out strategy that is different than the way most wireless carrier strategies are for wireless. Typically wireless carriers or MNOs, mo uh, mobile network operators, uh, have an outside in strategy. That is they build macro architecture from the outside and then they try to penetrate indoors, being somewhat simplistic, but that's generally how they build their networks. 
uh, cable, or at least charter, look at it the exact opposite. We look at it inside out, meaning, again, 80% of traffic takes place inside the home or office. And so we want to build our infrastructure within the home uh, and then opportunistically build outdoors where there is traffic density to justify that build. So that's exactly uh, what we intend to do. And that's when we say inside out, that's exactly what we're talking about. The other thing to keep in mind, particularly with 5G, is that we're going from, if you look at 2G and 3G and 4G networks, they were traditionally built on macro architectures, large towers, broad coverage. Uh, with 5G, even the end of 4G, but certainly with 5G, there is going to be a transformation from macro-based architectures to small cell architectures. And there's a reason for that. In order to generate uh, both bandwidth and latency performance objectives of 5G, one of the critical aspects is spectral reuse or reusing spectrum multiple times. And that's what a small cell architecture enables. That's great. And, and that's, a, um, a, you know, that's an admirable goal for all of us. I think the real issue with building out a pervasive small cell architecture though, and there's an irony here, is you have to have a pervasive widely distributed wireline network in order to enable that wireless uh, architecture of the future. And we honestly believe that Cable's HSC plant, hybrid fiber coax plant, is an excellent vehicle for that because it provides power right of way and backhaul uh, for all of that small cell radio equipment, whether those are 4G small cells or 5G small cells. And so we're excited about the possibilities. So whether we're talking inside the home or outside the home, we believe Cable is going to be the first truly scalable fixed mobile convergence platform. And what I mean by that is we're going to take our wireline infrastructure, our fantastic DOCSIS roadmap, and combine that with future wireless technology standard development into a true fixed mobile convergence. So DOCSIS, let's talk about that for a minute, right? DOCSIS, today we're rolling out DOCSIS 3.1 that uh, enables multiple gigs as much as 10 gigs, um, still asymmetric. And then following uh, closely after DOCSIS 3.1, uh, we have full duplex DOCSIS, which truly could enable as much as 10 gig symmetric and even beyond that. But let's just call it 10 gig symmetric today. Well, one of the other things we need though, is we think about using DOCSIS and Cable's HSC plant and its wireline infrastructure to truly enable uh, future technologies uh, for that fixed mobile convergence that I talked about. Uh, uh, is to make sure that DOCSIS can support the low latency objectives of 5G standards development. So if you think about what 5G means, there's a lot of different things. The things that really matter, at least in my mind, for 5G, bandwidth matters. And we've talked about using small cells to and spectral reuse to really increase bandwidth. There's other things that drive bandwidth increase. Uh, service flexibility matters uh, in terms of the concept of network slicing and using a common core to enable multiple different slices or use cases. And maybe the most important thing, at least in my mind, is latency matters. And so when we talk about migrating from 4G to 5G networks, the end-to-end -end latency, or the time it takes from a packet to get from transmitter to receiver and back, is fundamentally lower, as much as a uh, 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 sub-millisecond. And so in order to make that work uh, across a DOCSIS network, we need a low latency set of solutions. And so what we're going to hear about today is uh, some of the early ideas for how we can take our existing DOCSIS network and overlay it with LTE wireless networks in something uh, called pipelining or, or par parallel passing uh, the latency objectives of both DOCSIS and, uh, uh, and LTE wireless networks to minimize the overall end-to-end -end latency. That's incredibly important as we talk about how we would be able to enable our DOCSIS HSC networks uh, for true fixed mobile convergence, particularly as we talk about 4G and especially 5G, uh, where those lower latency requirements are essential. So with that, I think I will hand it back to Rob. I'm open for any questions anybody might have on the, uh, on the phone. Thanks so much, Greg. That was a great review of Charter's wireless strategy and roadmap. Let's ask a couple questions here just to pick up on some of the themes that you outlined. And one is, this notion of DOCSIS as the, the key ingredient for mobile backhaul, that might be new information for some of our listeners today. We hear a lot about fiber as the key enabler for mobile backhaul. So can you just outline what's the case for DOCSIS relative to fiber? So good, great question. And we'll use fiber too. In fact, uh, maybe it's a dirty secret, maybe it's not, but that HFC network stands for hybrid fiber coax. So 
So not just charter, but all of cable has extensive fiber infrastructure as well. So there are absolutely going to be cases where we use fiber for, for backhaul as well. And as we think about how we use fiber already for our enterprise businesses and how we use fiber uh, to provide cell backhaul already to wireless carriers to their macro towers, uh, there is pervasive fiber already. However, when we talk about uh, DOCSIS and the importance of coax, it's really important when we say one of the key advantages we have is, is our HSC network uh, provides backhaul, right of way, and power. Let's emphasize power for a minute. That coax, the coax plant of HSC can be used as the power uh, co uh, 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 conduit uh, for the powering of that 5G infrastructure. Fiber in general is a passive platform. We need both, high, we need both fiber and coax so that we can provide not just backhaul, uh, but also power. Uh, and then, of course, with HFC, we have right of way, right? We can actually hang small cell equipment onto our infrastructure, just like we already do with outdoor Wi-Fi. I would say in the home, especially, though, uh, we're going to continue to pervasively deploy DOCSIS as an infrastructure. And again, if you think about uh, the future of, of wireless networks, you know, 80 percent of that traffic and likely to be even a higher number going forward uh, is going to take place inside the home or office. And so, you know, we're not planning to build fiber, uh, certainly not going to overlay fiber onto existing uh, DOCSIS infrastructure, um, you know, where DOCSIS has this fantastic roadmap already that I already described with DOCSIS 3.1 and full duplex DOCSIS. And so one of the things we really need to, to address is how do we, uh, not only with this fantastic uh, DOCSIS roadmap, but how do we drive lower latency so that we can support those future applications? And so we just think DOCSIS is going to be a, a critical part going forward of, of how we support uh, uh, future networks and, and definitely will be part of the backhaul solution uh, going forward. Yeah, okay, great. So clearly you see mobile and fixed broadband networks converging further together. Um, what are some of the potential barriers to doing that? You talked a bit about latency. Are there other elements, whether it's spectrum availability or the development of the ecosystem at 3.5 gigahertz or, or other factors that you see? Yeah, I mean, those are all uh, those are all obstacles. I don't think they're insurmountable, right? So when we talk about how will uh, do fixed mobile convergence, the the wireless component, particularly for cable operators, is is in some sense, you know, we're somewhat new to the game there. Not new in wireless in general. Like I said, I think we're I think uh, uh, we're leaders when it comes to Wi-Fi. Almost no question that that's true. But for licensed technologies, that's something we're relatively new to. Uh, I would say, though, that, you know, we are going to look at all kinds of different spectrum options. There's really no spectrum op option out there that we wouldn't uh, strongly consider. We'll certainly look at uh, low frequency bands, uh, as low as 600 megahertz. We'll absolutely look at uh, millimeter wave you know, for 5G. In fact, we have at Charter and, and other cable companies, we've been conducting uh, millimeter wave trials uh, for 5G over the last year, and we'll continue to do so. So we'll learn more about uh, what the specific use cases that can be used. Uh, uh, for millimeter wave. I would say we're maybe particularly interested in, uh, in um, 3.5 in CBRS, Citizens Broadband Radio Service. Uh, that is a interesting uh, spectrum that the FCC is, is working through right now. In fact, there's a, uh, some real key decisions that are going to be made about CBRS in terms of how uh, it will actually roll out. Uh, and that, uh, you know, could affect um, how aggressive cable or any other um, uh, group would be in terms of their attitude towards CBRS. But, but it's 3.5 gigahertz. So if you think about Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz today. So 3.5 is kind of right in the middle. The form factor for a CBRS small cell will look very similar to what a Wi-Fi access point looks like. Uh, what's interesting about the, that frequency is that it really is the way the FCC rules are going to be set up. It's really set up to be a small cell technology in terms of the relatively limited output power that will be required, but it's also a shared regime. It's the first time that's happened with the FCC where uh, instead of either completely unlicensed like Wi-Fi or, or dedicated license like most wireless carrier traffic is, it's really kind of right in the middle. Uh, so there'll be 150 megahertz uh, for CBRS uh, and it'll be shared. So there'll be three tiers. There'll be an incumbent layer. There'll be a middle tier called PAL or priority access license uh, so 70 megahertz of that 150 will be earmarked for licensed traffic. And then the remaining eight, uh, excuse me, 80 megahertz of that 150 megahertz will go to GAA or the third tier. A GAA stands for general availability access or really unlicensed. And so what you have here is 
up to 150 megahertz that can be shared and used when no one else is using it. Uh, at the same time, if you want licensed traffic within that tier, you can go after it through a future auction, and that's that PAL tier that I talked about. And so I think that uh, cable in general is very interested to see how that will develop. I will say that uh, Charter is certainly looking at that as a potential small cell technology that we would deploy, again, both in the home and outdoor. Great. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, some really interesting and exciting developments there. We may want to come back to talk more about the development of 3.5 gigahertz. I'm sure our listeners are, are interested in that. Um, we're going to move now to uh, Jennifer Andrioli Fang and, and John Chapman, who will take us through some of the technology that's been developed to enable mobile backhaul over DOCSIS. So Jennifer and John, take it away. Thank you very, thank you very much, Rob, for the introduction. Good morning. Did you realize that half of Cable Labs members are already mobile operators? That's right. The other half are trying to get into the mobile space. But the fact is, mobile operators have the incumbent's advantage. They own the radio access network, they, they have the macro cells, they, like Craig said, they have mobility, and they're trying to deploy small cells in order to uh, increase coverage and capacity. So how do cable comp compete? It turns out cable operators can deploy small cells too, and probably more easily, in fact, because cable operators have the plant. And today we're going to talk about the technology that makes the plant work better and more efficient for mobile backhaul. There's many, hi everybody. There's many aspects to this business case. Craig did a really good job articulating the interest of cable operators getting into the mobile space. And in fact, many cable operators, as Craig mentioned, are already either mobile operators or backhauling mobile networks or planning on getting into mobile. Um, and so there's a huge market opportunity to go build a mobile plant for the use of the operators. At the same time, while building out a small cell network, there's an opportunity to build a small cell network for other operators who might need a small cell network but don't have the infrastructure to build it. So not only can you build uh, a network where you service your own spectrum, but you can service other people's spectrum. And then as Craig mentioned, it's more than just a small cell LTE play, it's also a Wi-Fi play. And there's Wi-Fi access points all over the network right now in the HSC plant. And those Wi-Fi access points and LTE access points can go ahead and share the plant. And a common theme on this in the HSC network is, is both a fiber backhaul and a DOCSIS backhaul, especially when you do the, the inside out strategy, which is in the home, it's pretty much exclusively a DOCSIS environment. So from a technical perspective, how do we make DOCSIS become a viable backhaul for LTE? Right now, they both have inherent latency in them. How do we get rid of that latency the best that we can? and allow the two technologies to work together so that DOCSIS can be fundamentally fiber-like in its quality and uh, its ability to backhaul LTE. So let's take a look at a cable plant. Uh, many of you probably know what a cable plant looks like, but many of you might not. This is a picture of today's cable plant. Uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see the home. On the left-hand side, you'll see something called a hub, which is where the equipment goes, the transmission equipment. Also, that's where the DOCSIS equipment goes, the CMTS, the cable modem termination system. There's a box that goes there that connects to, at one end, the CMTS, and the other end, a cable modem in your home. And the middle is this HSC plant, the hybrid fiber coax plant. The way to think about that is coming out of the hub site is point-to-point -point fiber that goes down to your neighborhood. That goes to something called an optical node. It's not the digital fiber you're familiar with today. It's actually just a, a television lineup modulated on top of a, a Lambda. So the, the fiber goes out to the neighborhood, hits an optical node, and from there it gets converted into coax, and it just starts being um, split and repowered and split and repowered until it gets to your home. So one point-to-point -point connection goes into a coax network, which might end up hitting about 500 households pass or something like that. There's amplifiers along the way, and then there's, there's a tap on the, on the street in front of your house that brings a drop cable into your house. Sometimes the plant is above ground, so you have strand mount equipment, sometimes it's below ground. It's always powered with 60 or 90 volts AC, and it always has DOCSIS on it, and of course, video. And, and it's the DOCSIS component we're focusing on today, which provides that IP backhaul component. So what drives the uh, backhaul latency requirement today? Let's think of an example. Let's say that you're a user and you're in between two small cells or in between uh, a small cell and a macro cell. And uh, you can hear your own signal as well as lots of interference from other small cells or macro cells. The interference generally is a bad thing. It generally trans, uh, translates to bad user experience. 
And LTE solves this problem by letting one cell talk at a time and frequency so the other cells can't really create noise. The, the problem is that these cells are chatty. They're, they're, they're constantly trying to figure out who's going to be talking next. And they need to do that really fast. What this means is that DOCSIS as a backhaul will need to provide generally less than five milliseconds of latency to make sure that they can talk fast enough. So the question here is, can this five milliseconds be supported today? So today on DOCSIS, five milliseconds is pretty much the minimum latency. And this is based upon uh, measurements we've taken on a DOCSIS 3.0 network. The typical latency in a DOCSIS network might be around 11 milliseconds. And we're talking about upstream latency right now. Downstream latency actually is a lot quicker. Um, and it can extend out to 20, 30, sometimes even 50 milliseconds if you get contention on the upstream and, and there's retries. Um, so our goal really is, you know, can we take that 5 to 20, 5 to 50 type of upstream latency and shrink it down to 1 or 2 milliseconds? And that brings us really to our proposal for the bandwidth report. The uh, a new message that we're looking at introducing into the uh, DOCSIS world that would allow us uh, some communication between the DOCSIS world and the LTE world. To understand how that works, let's take a look at the inside workings of DOCSIS and LTE. So in the downstream, DOCSIS just works like Ethernet. A packet comes in, the CMTS it just comes down, everybody listens to it. The upstream is different though. There's a whole bunch of endpoints that need to talk. And so the upstream is a request grant mechanism where everybody asks permission to talk and then they're allowed to talk. So let's take an example. That cave modem that's in your house, data is going to come into that from your laptop. And when it does, like a packet comes in, the cave modem will issue a request. Um, the CMTS will at some point in time issue a grant. And then that grant says send the data at some future point in time and then the data goes up. And so you can see data coming in the cave modem, some messaging, and then data coming out of the CMTS. So that's the, the five milliseconds minimum that we've seen. This, of course, can be longer if there's a contention or something like that, but it can also be held quite tight to this if we do quality of service. So now let's take a look at how LTE works. So at the heart of LTE uplink channel access, there's the same three-way message exchange as DOCSIS. So here we can see that uh, we have that BSR grant and data loop uh, data loop, just like DOCSIS, where BSR is a buffer status report that's equivalent to the DOCSIS um, request, bandwidth request. And then we have the grant and the data that's the same as DOCSIS. The difference here, here though, is that the LTE message exchange is longer. We look at BSR, so from, from the time that the user sends the request to when it's granted, there is a four millisecond delay. And then when the user gets a grant and when the data is sent, there's another four millisecond delay. And then there is uh, LTE adds on um, additional messaging before and after this fundamental three-way loop here. So the bottom line here is that LTE latency is, uh, the, the LTE uplink channel access latency is gonna be uh, greater than the DOCSIS. And so the question here is, is there an opportunity here for us to use? So if you think about it, when the LT scheduler is scheduling the uh, UE, so when the e small cell, which is an E node B, is talking to a, a cell phone known as a user equivalent or UE, is telling the cell phone what to do in the future. What if it also told the DOCSIS system what was going to happen? I mean, the LT scheduler is really predicting the future because it's creating the future. What if the two systems communicate with each other? And what if we could take the latency, you know, instead of having uh, to do request grants and have latency in LT and then the same thing in DOCSIS, what if we could somehow hide the DOCSIS latency underneath LT? So we're not getting rid of the DOCSIS latency, but we're hiding it under the LT latency. In theory, we could engineer a system that had effectively zero latency in a DOCSIS system. In practice, there's always some kind of engineering margin that's in there. So we're targeting the one to two milliseconds as our goal. How would we do that? And could we do it? This is how the backhaul system works today. So on the left-hand side, we have an LTE system, and then on the right-hand side, we have a DOCSIS system. So a little note here on the color scheme. Without, it's pretty cool to, um, to, uh, to denote green, as, uh, which represents the color of ground uh, for DOCSIS, and then blue, which is color of sky that represents LTE. And I will try to keep it consistent throughout this, uh, this presentation here. So we have two systems here, and uh, what we did here is that we single out the you know, B scheduler, the small cell scheduler, 
and uh, the, the CMTS scheduler, because the schedulers are really the brains of this operation. The, um, the LTE and DOCSIS systems, they're both request and grant systems. And how it works is that, um, let's say that UE has packets to send, so the UE would ask for bytes, and then uh, ask, to send, uh, ask to send bytes, and then it gets granted, and then it sends data. And really, that's how DOCSIS works. Uh, it works the same way. So both systems are request grant systems. Both systems are very similar. And, and it's interesting, they're developed by different people at different times and different committees, and yet they work in a similar way. So what if that scheduler on the left-hand side and the LTE system talked to the scheduler on the right-hand side? And we would talk together, we're proposing with the message called BWR, the Bandit Report. Fundamentally, the Bandit Report becomes a request into the DOCSA system. So on the right-hand side in the green box, you see a request message coming from a cable model. That would be a layer two request, which would be strictly internal to DOCSIS. But what if we add a layer three request called the balance report? It's fundamentally an API into the DOCSIS scheduler. And the mechanics of this balance report is it allow an external entity, such as a small cell, to ask for some number of bytes at some, some future point in time. So let's take an example. Over on the left-hand side, the UE, which is a cell phone, would request, say, set up a request saying, I need to send a thousand bytes. The LTE scheduler would send back a grant message saying, all right, in eight milliseconds, send your thousand bytes. <clears throat> it would then send a balance report message over the CMTS and say, hey, I'm going to send you a thousand bytes across your Ethernet interface, because the Ethernet interface is a common interface between the two. And I might tell the CMTS, I'm going to send you a thousand bytes nine milliseconds from now. The CMTS would get this request message long before bytes ever showed up at the cable modem, and that would allow it to schedule grants, let's say, 10 milliseconds from now. So the packets leave the UE 8 milliseconds from now, they hit the Ethernet interface 9 milliseconds from now, and at 10 milliseconds from now, they go through the cable modem. That's how the system will work. Let's, uh, let's take a look at it from another angle. What, what we've really done here is uh, pipelining the two, the two systems together. And uh, you know, pipelining makes these two systems work together. So instead of having um, request grant, request grant kind of loop, we have uh, two, essentially two closely spaced grants. And this happens when the CMTS gets a BWR message rather than uh, you know, instead of waiting for the, the modem request, the native DOCSIS modem request. And the BWR prompts the CMTS to issue a DOCSIS grant that occurs quickly after the, the LTE grant. And uh, the zero to one millisecond latency that John was talking about earlier, and that is achieved because DOCSIS grant can arrive just in time to transport the, the LTE data. Now, there's a lot of other considerations to take into account when you're talking about the thousand bytes that go from the cable modem, uh, sorry, from the LTE system or the cable modem, those thousand bytes can be in different queues uh, because each, the, both the LTE system and the DOCSIS system observe quality of service. So different types of traffic go in different queues. So when you're describing those bytes, you have to reference the queue that it's in. And of course, LTE and DOCSIS have different queues. So there's a set of configuration information that we need to share between the LTE system and the DOCSIS system to maintain quality of service between the two systems and effectively to line up those queues. Okay, so I see that there is uh, there there were some questions coming in about the remote FI. So I'm glad that we have the slide ready. the The point here is that as we cable, we, as we split the CMTS, you know, from uh, the integrated CMTS to remote FI and cloud CMTS, the mobile industry is moving in the similar direction. What they call the virtualized run, the VRUN or the C run, is really similar to what we've done for DOCSIS by removing the lower layer components such as FI to remote locations. And VRAN is actually really synergistic with DOCSIS remote FI architecture. And the even better news here is that BWR works well in this architecture and works even better because uh, instead of the BWR as a message, instead of getting sent on the DOCSIS link, it is now sent in a cloud in between two schedulers. And BWR is extensible. We developed a proof of concept system, which we're going to show in a moment, that works with DOCSIS 3.0 and 4G LTE, because those are the systems that are currently available. But of course, BWR is extensible to DOCSIS 3.1, which is the next generation of DOCSIS out of Cable Labs, which features OFDM, and is extensible to 5G. 
Uh, 5G builds on the uh, foundations of, of 4G and, and fundamentally speeds everything up, and so will we by merely taking the pipelining concept and uh, increasing the pipelining and speeding that up. And there's a number of uh, technologies that Cable Labs is working on right now to go ahead and uh, provide lower latency services over DOCSIS. And one of the features that that'll have is to be able to accelerate the whole BWR infrastructure as well. That was all theory talk. And now we're going to get to the really cool part, something that I'm really, really excited about. So we've built a, we actually built a physical LTE and DOCSIS testbed. And this is our setup here. We have a commercial LTE user device. And uh, this UE is talking to a uh, open source LTE ENOB, LTE small cell. And that is backhauled through a commercial DOCSIS 3.1 mm -hmm. modem. And that is talking to a Cisco CBR8 uh, CMTS that is not shown here. And so what we've done here was that we um, inserted a small amount of code into the LTE Mac layer, the scheduler, so that we didn't really change anything about the scheduler, but we asked the scheduler to spit out its scheduling decision and put it in the form of a BWR message. And that message gets sent on the DOCSIS uplink and uh, that is received by an API on the CBR8 that looks at the message and uh, works on it and then uh, spit out the, uh, the traditional DOCSIS um, uh, bandwidth request, which is an input to the today's CMTS scheduler. So um, we sent a series of ping packets from the LTE UE to the CMTS um, to see if BWR gives us any uh, latency advantage or not. And here are the test results. On the graph, you'll see a red line going through the middle. That's at five milliseconds. Our goal was to build a system where we could get latency below five milliseconds, which it previously was the, the fastest the DOCSIS upstream system would go. So on the graph, you can see what happens when we turn the BWR messaging system on and when we turn the BWR messaging system off. In this particular screen capture, we were able to reduce the upstream latency from eight milliseconds to approximately four milliseconds. With some uh, manual tuning in the lab, we were actually able to take this down pretty close to a millisecond of upstream latency. So it worked. So this brings us, I think, to the conclusion of our seminar today. And I think the messaging that we would emphasize is that, you know, the BWR method, the bandwidth report, it works today with LTE and DOCSIS 3.0. And it's going to work with the newer technologies, DOCSIS 3.1 for the cable environment and 5G for the LTE environment. And DOCSIS, which is really just IP over cable, um, and, you know, fiber is just IP over fiber. DOCSIS is well positioned as a viable backhaul technology for LTE. And this will support the inside out strategy that uh, Craig talked about and really will support strand mount. It'll, it'll, it should support the entire small cell rollout. But the path to success is actually having mobile and DOCSIS technologies working together as one. And when we show the, the proof of concept to the operators, uh, our operator members had showed a lot of interest. And therefore, we are starting a committee to standardize um, the, the BWR protocol itself. We were having a cable apps committee going on right now. And we're also working on carrying precision timing over DOCSIS. That is really fundamental to any small cell deployments and also perfecting the operation of a BWR itself. And so with all of these efforts, we're, I believe that we're on a good path to enable DOCSIS as a better mobile backhaul. And so this is it, our presentation, and I'm going to hand it over back to Rob for questions. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Jennifer and John. Really great overview of a technique you've developed called bandwidth report that can pipeline DOCSIS and LTE operations to really enable mobile backhaul. Let's get into some questions, and I would remind our audience that they can uh, type in questions into the go to webinar toolbar and uh, we can have this discussion. So I, I'd like to put this concept that you've outlined called bandwidth report in context. Do you really see it as the key innovation to enable DOCSIS for mobile backhaul or are there other uh, innovations, other techniques that you think will be important as well? You know, it's going to be a suite of techniques. I think band, uh, the bandwidth report is one of many tricks. For example, if you're going to have the LTE system and the DOCSIS system refer to some future point in time, everybody's going to have to agree on what the current point of time is. So we have another protocol we're working on, which is DTP, the DOCSIS time, time protocol, which will distribute 1588 timing across the DOCSIS system and then to the LTE system. So everybody's going to have a, a common reference in time. 
And then there's a series of other techniques as well that Cable Labs is working on to um, speed up doctors. Okay, great. Thanks, John. And we've talked a lot about enabling um, DOCSIS for mobile backhaul, but I wonder, will some of these techniques also be applicable for enabling convergence with Wi-Fi and 802AX? We are exploring the possibility of that. I think that the key here is that um, the LT latency, uh, the reason that we can take advantage of possibly hiding the DOCSIS latency under LT latency is because the LT messaging um, exchange is longer than DOCSIS. So I think that we'll need a technology that has kind of a similar latency loop that we can take advantage of. And definitely 802.11ax works in similar ways um, in that it does have a centralized scheduling. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. So get some, getting some questions here from our, our audience around um, quality of service and the variability in performance that you might expect across uh, implementations of this technique. Can you comment on that, perhaps, John, and provide us any additional technical details that you, you think will be important to enabling consistency of performance? So for the audience, for our audience, let's define kind of the, what is quality of service and whatever is its goal. So as you know, everything is sent in terms of packets. Let's so have a whole bunch of packets show up. So the question is, who gets to go first? And uh, you can imagine a stadium full of uh, people and one door to get out. And uh, if everybody tries to go through the door, they're not going to fit. But if somebody says, well, ladies first, all of a sudden there's less to go through the door and the ladies get out the door first. And the same thing is with quality of service. We might decide to give preference to signaling packets or we might give preference to voice packets um, ahead of regular bulk data packets. And that's quality of service. And so both of the systems, DOCSIS and LT, have a quality of service mechanism to them. Uh, voice, of course, is a classic quality of service feature in the LTE system, um, but probably more important than that is signaling. And so uh, BWR is a signaling message, so when we bring BWR into the DOCSA system, we need to classify it to a particular queue and then give it high quality of service so that it gets up to the CMTS quickly. And then any of the signaling messages that are coming in from the E node B, such as the ICOMP that Jennifer is talking about, we need to identify those and prioritize, uh, classify those to a queue and get those up quickly as well. So BWR tells us what's coming. We then need to, uh, once we have visibility of what's coming, take those packets, sort them to the appropriate queue, and then give that queue the appropriate quality of service so that the packets get up in the desired amount of time. This is kind of the fine print in the whole BWR contract, is once you, uh, you give the bandwidth, you have to figure out who to give it to. Okay, thanks, John. So what we've been talking about here is conforming the DOCSA spec to <laughs> this fixed bubble convergence. Is there anything you're aware of, Jennifer and John, happening in mobile standards to enable this convergence? Is 3GPP or other bodies considering uh, how their specs, either LTE or 5G, could be enabled for uh, the sort of backhaul and convergence? I'm not really aware of specific spec efforts so far. Um, I think that this is something that we're going to have to come back and check on. Yeah, and you know, from a, a, a DOCSIS perspective, the way you can look at BWR right now is it's an API into the DOCSIS system. So it's kind of part of the DOCSIS scheduling system. So it's uh, it's something that we can define at Cable Labs and the LTE world has the ability to write, fundamentally write to that API or the wireless world or anybody really can write to that API and can uh, connect to it on a DOCSIS system. Okay, so um, maybe a question here for Craig uh, around adoption. Now, um, Jennifer mentioned that we're right now essentially specifying and standardizing the technique that was outlined, this bandwidth report technique. Craig, can you comment at all on adoption in terms of the timeline that, that you see uh, relative to Charter's wireless strategy and, and this technique that Jennifer and John have outlined? If you mean adoption in terms of the timelines for the technology to develop and the ecosystem to develop, it's probably more a question for John and Jennifer, although my team at Charter, some of my wireless technology uh, uh, team members are, are part of that effort. Uh, in general, though, I would say that, you know, there is some time here because of, uh, because of the rules around CBRS. We, uh, so let me just back up a little bit. We, um, we intend to really drive more of a wireless convergence strategy in the home the way we talked about. So not just Wi-Fi, we certainly are committed to Wi-Fi. I want to be crystal clear about that. Uh, we're very aggressive about thinking about uh, 802.11ax 
and that will be part of it. But also, we'll, we'll think about IoT radios, and of course, we'll think about a femtocell, an LT femtocell in the home, and maybe converge it all into one form factor. But so when we talk about that, and if CBRS is the, uh, is the license spectrum we would do for, for that femto, uh, you know, there is some rules development that still needs to take place um, around that. And then there is an entire ecosystem of equipment manufacturers that is still uh, taking place. And then maybe, maybe the most obvious, the uh, mobile device uh, manufacturers have to support uh, 3.5 gigahertz as a frequency in the phones or, or in the United States called band 48 which is that CBRS spectrum. Uh, so all of those things are coming together. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts there. Uh, I mentioned the, you know, with CBRS, there's both a, a license component and unlicensed component. Well, that license component uh, has an auction that has not yet been scheduled, but sort of tentatively targeted for, um, you know, early 2019. Uh, devices will begin probably to be supported by the uh, end of this year, certainly by 2019. And so as you think about some of those different components, device support, uh, the equipment manufacturers also uh, looking at all of that and uh, deciding when they will support, you know, there is some time uh, for us anyway to, uh, to see this evolve. But clearly, you know, I would say, you know, as we would develop the solution and as we would have licensed fentos in the home, we definitely have to have an ability to to uh, pipeline and to do something like this that, that addresses lower latency. So I would say it would be somewhere in that, in that time frame. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Craig, to put that in context. That, that's really helpful. So I think we'll need to leave the discussion there. And thanks to all our speakers, Craig, Jennifer, and John. Uh, really appreciate the insights today. And of course, there are many other ways to stay informed about what Cable Labs is up to. Please visit our website and follow our blog to learn more. So that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you all for joining.